So we were talking about the existence of four matrices that have no rank or connections for which the conclusion of Strack's theorem is false. In other words, we have a sequence of functions tending towards them strongly in LP, but that, that convergence towards these set of functions does not imply that the sequence will converge strongly in terms of gradient. Okay, so theorem. There exists a set of four matrices. And we're going to actually write them down shortly. We're doing this in two by two, but obviously it can be done in any dimension. Very not obviously, but it can be. Matrices. Uh, let's call this set K, where there are no one connections in K, and there exists a sequence that can actually take into three Lipschitz functions from any domain, or any Lipschitz domain anyway, such that the limit as k tends to infinity of the distance of these guys, UK away from K, DX zero, but any subsequence, say KN, the gradients do not Virgin LP to DU, where DU is the weak limit. Of the sequence. Okay, so, uh, so this is most commonly associated with the name of Tata, but there are other guys who did this simultaneously, uh, a guy called Milton and some economics guy whose name I should have looked up, but I have forgotten. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to take a guess on it. All right, so proof. So in the last class, we established this building block. So So we've showed that uh, we showed that that given well I showed this for a rectangle, but by easy arguments it'll work for any other convex domain. So given convex uh, say uh, domain Pi and any matrices, any R1 connected matrices, or any, let's just write this, A and B belong to 2 by 2, rank of A minus B is equal to 1. Uh, we're going to take f to be lambda of a plus 1 minus lambda of b, like this. Again, in the proof, I took lambda to be a half, but you could easily take lambda to be any number between 0 and 1. And um, or strictly between 0 and 1. There exists uh, let's call it 
v from pi to r2 such that, or let's say this way, for any epsilon, there exists v from pi to r2, which has the following properties that the integral of the distance of the gradient of v away from the set a v is less than epsilon. Actually, v can be made to be equal to the linear combination of a and v on the boundary. And this isn't relevant for the proof, but it's just interesting, so, and it will be relevant for something I want to tell you about later, so, glued in brackets. We can also have that, um, that all the gradients of this mapping, so the v of x belongs to uh, an epsilon neighborhood of linear combination between a and v almost everywhere. Okay, so this is what we showed, and we did the standard laminate thing that I've shown you several times. A, B, A, B, A, B. And the point was we could create these functions that would sort of interpolate between the boundary given by F and A and B. And, um, and we could create these functions such that we'd have, a, in the end, the Lipschitz function V. I um, should perhaps add that. And we can even create it so that these interpolation things we have to add are such that they are within a very small neighborhood of linear combination between A and B. In fact, a small neighborhood of this mapping F. Okay, so that's where we were. You know, hopefully, those of you who had to leave, uh, watch the end of the video and are happy with that. So, this is what we're going to use as the key thing. And... I have to make such a big diagram that I'm thinking I should just erase and start with a new board. All right, so as I erase, look over the statement of what I just wrote. And uh, so we're going to make the identification between diagonal matrices and points on the plane. So. like this, okay? Now, if we do this, then diagonal matrices are rank one connected if and only if one of their entries, either A or B, are the same. So let me show you what I mean. So, so note, rank of A1, 0, 0, B1, minus A2, 0, 0, B2, equals zero if and only if either, well, I mean, uh, we can just explicitly write this down, right? This means the determinant of the difference equals zero, which will only happen if a1 equals a2 or b1 equals b2, and or means or in the and or sense that both of these can happen. So then logic or includes the possibility of and. All right, everybody happy? No? So if we make this identification between diagonal matrices, and what about and or, just in case? <laughs> that seems wrong, and or. So um, if we make this identification in this way, then uh, we can simply draw points on the plane to identify matrices, and straight lines between points on the plane represent rank one connections between matrices. Yeah? So we're actually going to come up with our set of four matrices that have no radical connections as diagonal matrices. And, and this is, I mean, I think everybody said it's called the Tata square. 
most typically because it looks a bit like a square. So how do we do it? We go like this, we go like this, we go like this, and we go like this. Okay, and this can be one of our matrices, this can be another, this can be another, and this can be another. Okay, so let's give them coordinates just to be completely concrete. So this will be 1, 1 right here. So what will this be? This will be 1, 2. Uh, this will be uh, 1 minus 1. So this will be uh, 2 minus 1. Uh, this will be minus 1 minus 1. So this will be minus 1 minus 2. And this will be right here, minus 1, 1. So this is going to be minus 2. One. This one? Yeah, this is zero, zero right here, so... Yeah. Cool. So, let's call this guy A1, A2, A3, and A4, right? None of these guys have rank one connections by what we just what we just talked about, yeah? Cool, all right, but let's identify these following points that we also see on this picture. Let's call this point here B1. I'm not gonna give them coordinates this time. Let's call this point B2. Let's call this point B3, and let's call this point B4, okay? Now, the way I've set this up, what we can see is that uh, there is a rank one connection between A1 and B1 because they're on the same straight vertical line. Yeah? And there is a rank one connection between B2 and A2, yeah? and there is a rank one connection between A3 and B3, and so on. So we can use our building block by starting with a mapping that takes gradients either A1 or B1. And we can create something which does that because they're rank one connected, right? So let epsilon be bigger than zero. And let's create a, so I'm gonna to have to create a big, biggest picture here. And let's just create something that alternates between A1 and B1 like this. So for the purposes of the diagram, I'm making quite thick layers, but we're going to take the thickness to be epsilon over 2, like this. So we have gradients A1, this is B1, this is A1, this is B1. You all agree we can do that, no? Cool. But if we look here, B1 itself is a linear combination of A2 and B2. In fact, the way we set it up, it's exactly B2 plus A2 divided by 2 gives us B1, yeah? So, we can apply our previous building block where we take B1 to be the F, the affine boundary condition, and B2 and A2 to be this A and B, yeah? We can create a function which is gonna take most of its gradients either in B2 or A2, it's gonna agree with the affine boundary condition, B1, and we're going to replace these blocks of B1 by these functions that, that have gradients mostly in B2 and A2. And so the direction we have these... Guys, actually maybe the direction... Huh, maybe it does work out rather nicely, like vertical or horizontal in this case. So yeah, uh, this B1... This, yeah, right, so A1 and B1 agree on the Y direction, so we do indeed go vertical horizontal. So I should have like flipped it the other way around, it should have been initially vertical, okay, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. So we're going to replace this, this B1 by B2, A2. And it's gonna the 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 interfaces are gonna be in the perpendicular direction to the original interfaces, because we have that a1 and b1 agree uh, on this direction, uh, 
Oh no, I actually it's actually starting the right way. So A1 and B1 agree in the E1 direction, right? So this is the E1 direction, and A1 E1 equals B1 E1, right? This is the interface where they agree. No? But now if we do um, B2 A2, they agree on the on the E2 interface. They have the same E2 coordinate. Yeah? So we're going to layer in the interfaces like this. Again, I'm putting in these layers thicker than than we would if epsilon was small, but obviously there's a reason. And we have to create these interpolation layers like this. So again, I'm drawing them smaller than they probably should be. Uh, yeah, so this, this, like this, like this, like this, like this, this, this. Should have ended with uh, even number. So these parts here are things that are not in any of these set of matrices that we've talked about. But these are thin layers, right? And we can choose this layer to have thickness epsilon over 4, like this, because we have the right to choose it as small as we like by the previous building block. And what we have here, we have a mixture of B2 and A2. So we have B2, A2, B2, A2, B2, A2, B2, A2, and so on. Yeah, and do the same thing here. And you can kind of guess what's going to happen now, right? So these things, these strips, are uh, strips we just have to sacrifice. These are just errors. Yeah. But we don't care too much about them, right? So uh, I'm just compelled to do B2, A2, B2, A2, B2, A2, B2, A2, B2, A2, right? Now, the A1 are the inside, you know, we want gradients to be inside of A1, A2, A3, A4, so we're happy with that thing. We're happy with, with the guys here that are in A2. Those are okay, because we're trying to you know, do that thing. We're not constructed inside that set. The B2 is the guy we want to replace, right? We want to replace B2 by something which has got more gradients in the set A1, A2, A3, A4, the set K. You know? But we can do this because B2 itself is a linear combination of A3 and B3. So I should maybe have written some of that stuff down. So, so we are using in this first step that B1 was 1 over 2 uh, uh, of B2A2. Yeah. And we also have that B2 is 1 over 2 of A3B4. Like this. So all of these B2s we can again just replace by a linear combination of B3, A3 and make them agree on the, on the boundary. Yeah? So it gets pretty hard to draw this because these pictures are getting finer and finer and these layers are getting finer and finer and finer. But we're going to layer in layers like this. Maybe I want to even change color. Let's layer in layers like this and now again we are changing direction of the layers. Looks like Right? So we're layering in these further strips like this. Okay, so just to really emphasize what's happening, let's take a magnifying glass or a microscope and blow up this picture right here. To this sort of size. And what do we see? We have something like this. So this is A2, this is A2, there's some kind of interpolation layer like this. And then 
what we are doing is we are finding this linear combination of B3A3 like this. This is B3, A3, B3, A3, B3, A3, B3. And again, we can make them agree on this boundary here. Right, so this is looking messy. So these are errors here where we can't do anything, but we can put in these strips as thin as we like so that all the errors we obtain from doing all of these things, so you see this like strip of error on this side here and on this side here as given by this stuff, right? It can be made as small as we like just by making these things as thin as we like. Yeah? So by sticking in very thin layers, replacing the uh, B2, we can mean we can make that the total amount of interpolation layer we get from all of that stuff sums to be less than epsilon over four. Okay. So error from int layer. Any less than epsilon over, no, epsilon over eight, right? We did epsilon over four last time, so we're going to do epsilon over eight now. Right, so we can do that. Does everybody agree? Everybody happy? Thumbs up if that makes sense to you. No? Okay, cool. And now we're even happy because the amount of, of points in the domain where the gradient is not inside our set K is even smaller. It's now just these alternate bad strips here where we have these B3s, yeah? But B3 is a linear combination of A4 and B4, yeah? So again, we replace the B3 by linear combinations of the guys we want, or more of the guys that we want. So all of these B3s get replaced. And again, we can make it a nice Lipschitz function. We have a little interpolation there we have to add to the error. But again, we can make it as thin as we like, or as small as we like, by putting in these layers as thin as we like. Yeah, and notice that we are changing the set on smaller and smaller subsets of the domain. Yeah, so we're making smaller and smaller alterations to the function. Yeah? So we just continue this. We build the sequence of functions, and at each iteration, what are we going to have? So let uk be the iteration be the kth stage of this construction and what nice properties does it have well it has that that, well, I'm not going to try and make a specific estimate, but we know that the, the measure of the set of x that, um, that does not belong to any of these a1, a2, a3, b1, b2, b3, a1, a2, a3, a4, b1, b2, b3, b4, in other words, the, these, the measure of these interpolation layers, this thing is going to be the sum of epsilon over two, epsilon over four, epsilon over eight, up to epsilon over two to the K, right? Oops, UK, this is gonna be less than, uh, the sum from i equals one to k of epsilon over two to the k, two to the i, like this, no? And of course, we just factor this. Oops, two to the minus i. This is the point. 
the, so this is the case stage, right? And at the case stage, we still have some of these B guys left, yeah? But the measure of these, these B strips is tending smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So at each stage, we can replace the B by more and more of the A, in fact, as much of the A as we like, right? Um, and uh, so it's enough to simply write this, that the set of X such that the UK doesn't belong to uh, 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 just the set K It's, uh, uh, it's gonna, this, this includes the interpolation layer and the B guys. Actually, let me try and find a better way to express this. Let me write it like this. The set of points such that this thing belongs to this B1 up to B4, this thing, is going down to zero. Yeah. Cool. And as a consequence of the fact that we are changing this on smaller and smaller sets, right? The gradients being altered on sets of increasingly small measure, we also have that this thing is going to converge in the sense of gradients. Because it's a sequence of nicely bounded Lipschitz functions. And we are altering this on smaller and smaller sets. So it's actually going to converge strongly in the sense of gradients to some limiting function. U and then ALP, U1. Okay. Cool. Are you happy with all of those claims? Yeah? Cool. So in the limit, this limiting function, DU, actually won't have any of its gradients on the set B1 up to B4. We've replaced them all. Yeah? It will have some errors, but the set of errors will sum to be less than epsilon. Yeah? So, such that the u of x uh, the u doesn't belong to k, the measure of this thing is less than epsilon by construction. Yeah. Yeah. And we also know that this thing is, is, is within epsilon of the initial, the initial affine boundary condition that we set up, well, the initial linear combination between A1 and B1, right? So in terms of the function and not the gradient, we also have that U minus uh, let me write it this way. So u of x uh, uh, I need to have some gloves or something designed for this. So u of x minus this a1 plus b1 over 2 applied to x is less than epsilon for all x in our domain, which is not, let's say our domain was Q is this square. Okay, so where Q is, is just this unit square, zero, one, like this. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's pretty good for us, right? So this limiting function has its gradients in it as much as we like inside the set that that has no rankle connections, this set K. And it's pretty close to the initial affine boundary, which was given by linear combination of A1 and, and B1. Are you all with me here? Okay, let's 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 look at it. So do you agree that 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 at each stage? Okay. Do you agree that the, uh, the set where we are actually changing the uh, sequence of functions gets smaller and smaller and smaller? So, um, so what I claim is that there is an increasing 
there's an increasing subset of sets inside Q where on that increasing subset, the construction is not changing. Right? So this is my claim. There exists, let's say, omega k contained within Q, where omega k is contained within omega k plus 1, right? And the union of omega k, let me put it this way, that the measure of the difference is 0. So q, take away the union of all these guys, is equal to 0. And uh, u, the u of k plus p uh, is constant. Constant on yeah. At each stage, when we layer in more of these a, then we we don't change it anymore, and it's only on this increasingly small subset where we still have some b that we're still gonna. Uh, change it. Oh, this is not quite correct. It's not that it's this is this. No, it is that this is this. This is true. So where it's B, we don't change it anymore. And we have an interpolation layer, we don't change it anymore. It's only on the subsets of B that we keep changing it. And the, oh, start again. The subsets where the gradient takes things inside B1 up to B4, do we keep changing it? And that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It's a decreasing subset of sets. Yeah, so once we have this, then it's clearly a Cauchy sequence in any LP and therefore it converges strongly. But thank you for this question. That is a non-trivial point about the fact that it will converge strongly. Okay. Um, everybody with me? Everybody agree with this? So yeah, if we have something which has got gradients, just, just take a scalar function, taking gradients plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and we are interpolating it to be, you know, doing anything on some layer of thickness epsilon here, then the L infinity norm away from zero is just going to be epsilon. That's that's all we have here. Cool. So why why is this why is this construction good enough to kill the possibility of having no random connections implying that that we have strong convergence? Why does this counterexample that? I'll try and fit it on the top here while you give me an answer. Why is that the case? Well, we can just take a sequence epsilon going down to zero, right? So let Epsilon k going down to zero. Let let's not call them uk again. Let's call them wk. B mappings from the square into R two, which satisfy this property for R epsilon k. So the measure of the set of things such that d w of k doesn't belong to k is less than epsilon k. You know? And if x minus uh, a1 plus b1 over 2 of x is less than epsilon k in q, or almost everywhere in q, no, actually everywhere in q, so I'll just write in q like this, yeah? Um, it's uniformly a Lipschitz sequence of functions, yeah? Uh, so we know that this is satisfied that the distance of wk away from k with any p power we want, this thing is tending down to zero, yeah? For sure, yeah? But if we take any subsequence that converges weakly, what will be the weak limit of, of that subsequence? What will be the weak limit of this subsequence? Yep. So from this thing, if we have a, a sequence that is that is converging, or a sequence of gradients that's converging weakly to this thing, yeah, the only thing it can possibly be is this affine mapping whose gradient is got is equal to a1 plus b1 over 2. Like this, okay. Yeah. 
but then we can't possibly have strong convergence of gradients because this thing is not inside our set K, right? This thing is not a member. Yeah. So give myself some more space. So let's say, so the distance of the limiting function du of x away from k dx Yeah, to the power, yeah, that's the point, is less than the uh, LP distance between WK and W and LP, and then this thing here, right? By the triangle inequality. Yeah, because for every K, uh, MK is inside the set of, of, of matrices k, and therefore this is true for every k, right, for every small k, and then since it's true for every small k, this thing has to be equal to zero here on the left-hand side. Yeah? Um, and therefore the limiting function gradient of w should be belong to k, um, but it can't be because the gradient W is not belonging to K, it's actually just equal to A1 plus B1 over two, right? So there's no way you can have strong convergence of gradients when you have the sequence doing this thing. Yeah? Thumbs up if you're with me here. All right, cool. So that kills, that kills the, the, the conjecture you might, you might be tempted to have that lack of rank connections inside a set will allow us to go from weak convergence to strong convergence. And it's kind of odd because um, if we impose the additional assumption of connectedness, then it is true, that's Sparrow's theorem, right? That's Sparrow's theorem. So a corollary of this, actually I'm gonna raise the ball because there's just too much stuff here. <clears throat> a corollary of this is that if you have a set of matrices, so I mean, I gave you one, as you can imagine, there are many other configurations of the Tata square you could come up with. If you have a Tata square, then you cannot find a smooth, you cannot find a connected set containing these things that doesn't have rank one connections, right? Because if you could, then by Sraag's theorem, you would have that weak convergence improves as the strong convergence, yeah? So you can have these four individually non-rank one connected matrices that you cannot contain within a connected set that it has no rank connections inside all of it. Yeah? Cool. As I raise the board, think about that and think about why that's the case if you just think about diagonal matrices. If you just think about diagonal matrices, why is it the case that you cannot contain your four points of the di uh, your, your four points that represent the, the, the Tata square in a connected set that doesn't have rank one connections inside the diagonal matrices. Okay, and make it even simpler, make your connected set a one-dimensional closed curve. Okay. All right. This again is the Tata square. Okay. And the corollary is that we can't have any connected set containing these four points. Normally they're actually called, I think, T1, T2, T3, T4. Yeah. Why is it the case that we can't have any connected set going through all of these guys? Whatever, it could be doing something really exotic that doesn't contain rank one connections. Why? I mean, why can't I just... So, so rank one connection again is where we find A and B. So R1 connection. If and only if there exists A and B such that rank of A minus B is equal to one. There we go, there we go. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that's exactly right. So the only way we can possibly go through all four points 
is if we, for example, take any vertical line between T3 and T1, then there has to be points on the curve that connect that are across this vertical line, and there has to be two of them. Okay? And that is a rank one connection. So whatever this is called, call this A, call this B, then two points on a vertical line are rank one connected when we make this identification between diagonals and points in the plane. So, okay. so you are working harder than necessary to do this. Um, and also thinking algebraically instead of geometrically. So we have this very nice geometrical realization of what rank one connections means. It just means vertical horizontal lines in the, when we identify diagonals with points in the plane. And yeah, we see that there's no way to have any connected set going through all of these points. Um, yeah, so the way I did it, I did a closed set, but even if we just stopped like this, sorry, I did a closed, simple closed curve, but even if we just had a connected set like this, still couldn't do it because we would have that, that, uh, yeah, that guy going like this. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no way to have a connected set going through all of these uh, four points without having a horizontal line that cuts through two points of this connected set. Cool. So from that we see it's not it's not so surprising that 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 Strax theorem and this and this example exist. Um, there's a beautiful theorem by, by Sekahedi and Farako that says that if you have any compact set for which this conjecture is false, i.e. a compact set which, which doesn't have rank one connections, but nevertheless uh, weak convergence doesn't imply strong convergence, then that set has to contain a copy of the Tata square. So after some, after some whatever, yeah, after some with some careful choosing of four points inside your set, it has to form a Tata square. So the Tata square is in a very fundamental way the only reason this falls, uh, this fails. Um, and if your set doesn't contain a Tata square, then then uh, then weak convergence uh, does imply strong convergence when you have a subset in in two by two. And that was a very famous paper, uh, and still is a very famous paper. This was. This was this conjecture was called Tartar's conjecture, even though his counterexample counters examples this conjecture. So I don't know why it's called Tartar's conjecture, but but this was the most definitive answer to Tartar's conjecture that the only way that it fails is if your set contains a natural Tartar square. And this was a paper in Actomath in about maybe 2005 or something like that. So one of the thoughts I was having was that I could maybe include this paper in the course, but. Uh, but yeah, obviously we're out of time. Uh, and that uses in a very deep way um, ideas from quasi-regular, quasi-conformal mappings. That's sort of an essential part of the proof of, of that theorem. Okay, good. Over time, um, thank you for your attention. We will talk more about this stuff and applications of quasi-conformal, quasi-regular mappings to, to calculus variations uh, uh, on Wednesday. Have a good day.